Hello friends, how are you doing today? It's Emma here, your bookish princess. We have a brand new year before us. 2018 has begun. First, I wanted to take a look back at 2017 and my 17 favorite books of the year. These are all books that you've heard about in my monthly reading wrap ups. I managed to do a reading wrap up every single month this year, which I'm kind of proud of. I also managed to do over on my blog, A Pinch of Fixie Dust, a quotation collection, where I put some of my favorite lines from the books I had been reading Many of those books will be making an appearance today. I've got my 17 favorite books from 2017. Now the discerning among you may notice that there are not actually 17 physical books in this pile because a bunch of the books were library books or ebooks. And of course, these are not books that came out in 2017. They're just books that I read in 2017. But they're all books that I really enjoy that have kind of stuck with me. I actually really like doing the number to fit the year because 17 is like a nice, generous number. It's nice that you don't have to be too particular, that you can think of a book and be like, oh yeah, I really enjoyed that. I'd like to include it and just include it. But to build up a little bit of suspense, I did save like maybe my, my five top books for the very end. I'm gonna try to go through these pretty quickly. I did talk about them all more in my various months monthly reading wrap ups, um, so if you're interested you can go back and watch those. I've got my list here in uh, my bullet journal. The first book on my list is Clooney Brown. This book is by Marjorie Sharp. I read it at the very beginning of the year in January, so it feels like a good book to start out with. I just loved Clooney's character. There is like no keeping her down. She's so unexpected, but she's so herself always. I've read a number of different Marjorie Sharp books, and I enjoy them all, but Clooney Brown is definitely the one I've loved most. It's British, and it's quirky, and it's just delightful. So I have a number of very pretty books in this pile, but these have to be some of the prettiest. They're Disney princess comics. I'm cheating and including them both as one entry here. Um, they're both illustrated by Amy Memberson. Um, I follow her on Instagram. I love her uh, princess, like the, the little princess comics. They're so snarky and funny and um, clever. And this is so delightful because it's the same style of illustration and it's so sweet. Like it's so pleasing and yet it has so much character. I just absolutely love these illustrations. Like the littlest, you can kind to see even just like the tiny fairies or like the tiny mice like their expressions in every little individual frame are so great you've got Belle so many funny bookish comics I love Tiana comics this is fun because it's kind of like after the happily ever after like Cinderella's in her palace you've got Merida you've got Snow White you've got Pocahontas just so delightful there isn't really any Moana I hope they'll come out with another of these um, with some Moana comics because those would be fantastic as well but if you have haven't checked these out. These also came out, I think, in just like the individual um, paper comics, but they have, uh, this is Pr Disney Princess 1 through 4, and this is Disney Princess 5 through 8, so, oh, love them so, so much. Speaking of after the happy endings, I hate it when a book ends, like, right before the happy ending, and you don't really get to see, like, you know, the characters coming together. That's one reason I always love Jane Austen, is because I feel like she gives you, like, a little bit of a glimpse of the happy ending. That's the reason I love this next book, because it gives you a really cool uh, glimpse of the happy ending of Lord Peter and Harriet Vane. This is a Lord Peter book by Dorothy Sayers. It is Busman's Honeyboon. It's the fourth book in the Lord Peter and Harriet Vane series. I somehow didn't realize it existed. I read the first three, Strong Poison, um, Have His Carcass, and oh, the one in Oxford, Gaudy Knight. I loved Gaudy Knight. That, that's probably still my favorite, but um, I just hugely enjoyed Bestman's Honeymoon. As the title suggests, it's about the honeymoon of Lord Peter and Harriet Vane. Of course, there's a murder that they have to solve, and it's just really good writing and a really cool follow-up. Like, it's cool to see Lord Peter and Harriet, like, settle down together, and, and of course, it's only the very early days of their marriage, but, like, you know, working out different difficulties. Sometime in the new year, I'm going to have to film a Penguin English Library collection. You can kind of see a bunch of them back there in the background. I love the way they look, um, the paperbacks lined up together. This paperback, I will be perfectly honest with you, I bought mostly because I liked the cover. 
It's Kim by Richard Kipling. This is advertised as Kipling's masterpiece. I've read The Jungle Book, but I'd never heard of, of Kim. I'm so, so glad I discovered this because it, it truly is his masterpiece. It's just amazing. It's such a vivid book. Like, it's really one of those books that whisks you away and completely surrounds you in a different, exotic um, environment. This is that in India, Kim is a young orphan and he's kind of finding his place in this vast, beautiful uh, melting pot of India. Of course, the British imperialists are there. You also have all the different people in the bazaar and the marketplace. You have a Buddhist priest that he ends up um, accompanying. And just, it's funny, this didn't grab me at first. Like the first hundred pages, it felt like it was a little slow going, but then it really just grabs you and doesn't let go. You could taste it and smell it. I just, I really enjoy this. This book is another classic. It's Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. This is the beautiful um, edition illustrated by Rifle Paper Company, by Anna Bond, who runs Rifle Paper Company. I have um, a bunch of the other Puffin and Bloom books, and the Puffin and Bloom books have the cover and then like the um, end papers by Anna Bond. This is fun because there are illustrations all throughout, and I have to admit, I'm partly including this because it's Alice in Wonderland, which is a great story, but then I'm also partly including it because of these lovely illustrations. I feel like both of those um, together just made me absolutely love reading this. I, I, I didn't remember much of the story. Like, I've seen the Disney movie, of course, um, but Lewis Carroll's I, I didn't remember much of. With Disney movies like Alice in Wonderland and Mary Poppins, like, they're kind of weird. There are definitely weird things in them when you watch them. But then when you actually sit down and read Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland or like P.L. Travers' Mary Poppins, you're like, wow. This, this is even weirder than the weirdness of the Disney movie. Like, they actually toned it down a little. And yet it's delightful. Oh, it's so... The mock turtle story. It's so, like, so weird, but um, just a fun time and a classic. I loved visiting Wonderland this year. Two Persephone books made it onto my 2017 list. This one I got for $3. I found it at... I can't remember the name of the bookshop. It was a used bookshop in Philadelphia. My friend Kate Howe um, from Booktube and I met up this summer and we did, it was this really cool uh, mystery uh, interactive tour of the library in Philadelphia. We, I, I thought it was just an amazing time. I did do um, a little bit of a video from that. Um, and we visited, I'm pretty sure it was the used bookstore attached to the library and it had a very interesting selection. It felt like all the books that like no one would ever check out from from the library so like there were a lot of titles that were just weird and a lot of books that you're like yeah I don't want this but um, this was a Persephone book so I was like I can't I can't go too wrong with it and it's three bucks it's Reuben Sachs by Amy Levy and I'm so glad that I found it I just I enjoyed it maybe because of the company it was keeping in that bookstore I didn't expect to love it but I, I really enjoyed it. it has lovely end papers of course as always all Persephone books do Amy Levy was the first Jewish student at Newnham College in Cambridge. Um, so Ruben Sachs deals very much with, uh, it's both a feminist plea and a satire on the materialism of late Victorian Jews. It felt like Jane Austen, but then set in like late Victorian uh, Jewish community. I felt like she had much of the same penetration as Jane Austen into characters and um, you know situations. And it's definitely darker in tone um, than Jane Austen, but it still had some just great writing and interesting story and one of those books that like I definitely want to visit again sometime. The short story Leaf by Niggle by J.R.R. Tolkien. Guys, this is such a charming, insightful, deep, beautiful, spiritual story. It's about an artist named Niggle who has this vision in his mind for an amazing painting, but all he ever manages to create in his life is one leaf. Like he's constantly distracted by other things. The book follows him after death. Obviously I don't want to spoil it, but he gets a chance to create um, the vision in his mind. Just sort of a good reminder that our, our work isn't going to be finished when we finish with this life, um, but the things that we do in this life if might set us up um, for the next life in, in ways we don't expect. The things that we don't think are important might end up being important. I know I just mentioned this in my December um, Reads video and I've been reading it uh, recently. I mentioned this in my Jane Austen gift guide video as well. It is just such an incredibly thorough, well-researched guide to England, obviously written from the perspective of a fan and a Jane Austen devotee. It includes things from her life, things from her books, and of course things from the films based on the books. So it's just a really beautiful medley. I oh, loved reading this this year. This book is like a bad penny. It has kept showing up on so, 
so many of my um, reading uh, wrap ups throughout the year, just in different months. And I have to admit, I'm not actually finished with it, but I'm pretty close. And I bought it this year and I've been reading it so much this year. It just, it feels like a 2017 book. It's a writer's diary being extracts from the diary of Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf has made it into, I think all three of my um, yearly wrap ups, 2015, 2016, and 2017. And yet I feel like I, I only end up reading like one Virginia book. Virginia Woolf book a year because it takes me so long to get through it. It's so dense. This is nonfiction, so this is um, her diary, and she talks a lot about, about the writing process, and then after the book has published, you know, reacting to different reviews. She also she also talks about books she was reviewing and books she was reading. I, I'm glad I've been reading it slowly because it because it's fun to kind of let it all sink in and just really interesting to get a closer insight into her craft. Speaking of dense writers and authors, this book, The Child from the Sea by Elizabeth Googe, is extremely dense, but I, like, I'm really proud of myself that I got through it. I, I did this as a buddy read, and I feel like all of us like kind of hit this wall like as we got further on. Like the further we got into it, it's like we were enjoying it, but it was kind of heavy going. 600 pages, but I did get through it, and I'm so glad I did. This. I have to say is not the place to start with Elizabeth Googe because some of her other books I feel like are much more approachable and um, this one is historical fiction. It's about um, the secret wife of King Charles II, uh, Lucy Walter. But once you've gotten used to Elizabeth Googe, um, this is really amazing. Just one after the next, really beautiful, insightful things that like you want to like kind of keep locked away in your brain because they're really, they're so inspiring and so encouraging. And yet what I love about Elizabeth Googe is how she she acknowledges pain, but she doesn't let pain kind of keep her down. She, she kind of sees through the suffering and the hardship to kind of a deeper reality and a deeper purpose. And yet she never trivializes the suffering. Um, she, she really enters into it and you do too, which is I think maybe why this was so difficult to get through sometimes because it, it did just, gosh, break your heart. But the descriptions were absolutely lovely. I did a whole um, video chat on Elizabeth Googe, so I'll make sure I link that up above. I, every year I feel like I managed to read a book of hers that I haven't read before, and it's like I don't want to read them too quickly because I love having new books to discover. Although, I also absolutely love rereading um, her books. So, uh, Elizabeth Googe, I, I know I've talked about her before. She's just way up there, We're right underneath Jane Austen as uh, one of my favorite authors. We're, I'm going to have to be careful now because the sunlight is whiting out my books. Where can I hold this? <laughs> this is The Blue Castle. It's by Ellen Montgomery. Ellen Montgomery, like Virginia Woolf, I think has been on every uh, reading wrap up so far. I never read this book before. It is um, more of adult fiction rather than children's fiction like um, Anne of Green Gables or Emily of New Moon. It's about Valancey Sterling who is kind of uh, suffocated by her family a little bit. She's very plain, her family kind of keeps her down, but she gets a surprising diagnosis from her doctor and it makes her decide to just stop sitting around and just get out and do what she feels like and it's really delightful. I love her adventures, I love the characters in this, I love the relationship between her and Barney, I think it's just so, so lovely. Just like thinking about this and talking about it makes me want to reread it, which is like, I, I should read something else. There there are still Ella Montgomery books I haven't read. Anyway, if you haven't read The Blue Castle, go check it out. It's just absolutely charming, a sheer delight. I feel like a number of these books are fun reminders of the places that I went and the things I did. Like I mentioned this Reuben Sachs I bought um, in Philadelphia. This next book I also encountered on our travels. We went to the Grand Canyon um, this summer, which was really amazing. I'd never been there before. And one of my favorite things about the Grand Canyon was getting to know Mary Coulter. This book is called Mary Coulter, Builder Upon the Red Earth. It's by Virginia L. Grattan. Mary Coulter was the architect and designer of many any of the beautiful buildings in the Grand Canyon's um, historic village. And I love the way she really made these buildings like fit the landscape. She researched um, Native American traditions and Native American design and really incorporated them into the spaces she created. And I love how this book has lots of old photographs um, because unfortunately some of the spaces um, she designed, she was a designer for the Harvey Company which, that built uh, hotels along the railroad and many of the hotels have unfortunately been destroyed. Um, at the Grand Canyon, you can still see a lot of the things that she designed, which is, is really cool. But it's fun that like you can get a glimpse of even the ones that are gone. I just absolutely love her style and her story. Yes, I've just absolutely loved getting to know Mary Culture this year. Alright guys, we're coming to the end. Oh dear.
<laughs> the sunshine is reaching my nose. I'm gonna have to scoop back here. This book is Old Herbaceous, a novel of the garden by Reginald Arknell. So just a lovely uh, paperback copy of it. It is so, so charming, so British. I love British literature, guys. What can I say? If you like Downton Abbey, you'll definitely like this book. Um, but it also has some really great gardening things. I've mentioned uh, many times before the novel um, Down the Garden Path by, Me by Beverly Nichols. I need to read more Beverly Nichols because he wrote other gardening books as well. But I was so glad to read this one. It's just a charming story, really well written. Like constantly little lines that you almost would, would miss. Here, here's one I starred. As with all truly creative pursuits, the appeal is to the mind and to the heart rather than to the pocket. So this is a pretty slim volume. It was a quick read, but definitely something I'll want to read again. So we might as well go from a short book to a long book. I read Atlas Shrugged by Anne Rand for the first time this year. I'd never read Anne Rand before. I started out with Anthem, which I really enjoyed. Atlas Shrugged, I, I talked about this more in October and November. I didn't love everything about it, but gosh, it sure pulled you in. And it pulls you along, which is pretty extraordinary for the length of that book, that it, it like maintains this sense of anticipation. There's some really amazing writing in it. Really, of course, amazing philosophical ideas, because it really is. A, a work of philosophy and you know I did like the characters I didn't love um, how the characters all wound up but I really loved the way they were set up in the beginning just a just a really stunning book and a challenging book that makes you think and I'm I'm so glad I took the time to read it this next book I read back in I think the spring but I feel like I've kept mentioning it at various times um, so it should be no surprise that it's pretty high up on the list. It's at the Existentialist Cafe, Freedom Being and Apricot Cocktails by Sarah Bakewell. This book is so, so great. It's obviously written from the perspective of someone who loves philosophies, who loves these existentialist philosophers. I didn't always agree with her, but she really communicated her enthusiasm in such an effective way. She really pulls you in. and it, it, It's like sitting at a cafe with a friend having an apricot cocktail. It's definitely made me um, pick up a couple of philosophical works um, by the many existentialists she mentions. I feel like I know them better now because she not only gives you an idea of like these philosophers' works, she also gives you kind of a great idea of who they were as people and some, some cool insights into their lives. Um, so you have, of course, Simone de Beauvoir, Jean-Paul Sartre, their friend Raymond Aron. You have Husserl, you have Heidegger. Even if you don't like philosophy very much, I think you would enjoy this book. These are my last two books. Surprisingly, I don't have one of them. I read it as an ebook, but I liked it so much that I definitely want to get a nice, um, nice uh, physical copy at some point. It's The Virginian by Owen Whistler. Ah. <sighs> This is another book that just thinking about it makes me want to sit down and reread it. Such a great adventure, but then also such a great portrait it's set in the West, so it really kind of captures the the environment of that time. It pulls you right into um, kind of these settlers, these farmers out there in the middle of nowhere. The characters are absolutely fantastic. The main character is the Virginian, and I don't think we ever learn his name, but you know him so well. Um, and there's such a great romance. <sighs> <sighs> this book even mentions Jane Austen. This book is like everything. Like excellent writing, really cool insights, really great setting, amazing characters, romance, adventure. I would highly recommend it. Last, but certainly not least, this is another book that was definitely a highlight of this year and I feel like I've mentioned a lot. My paperback copy of it was new just a few months ago, but it's already kind of beat up. This is Women Who Run With The Wolves, Myths and Stories of the Wild Woman Archetype by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. This is nonfiction, and yet it feels like fiction, it feels like poetry, it feels like philosophy. Within every woman there lives a powerful force filled with good instincts, passionate creativity, and ageless knowing. She is the wild woman who represents the instinctual nature of women. This is another book that I definitely am gonna wanna pick up again. It's another book I think of very often of the different themes and different stories. I think that's what I love so much about it. It's really, this is just a series of stories and then she kinda sits down and it's like sitting down around the fire like talking about the story and talking about it, what it means and why it, it unfolds the way it does. Beautifully written, beautifully put together, very spiritual. Well there you have it. I'm losing the light. I just filmed this video and the December Reads video so here should I show you right now? <laughs> there are literally just books everywhere. Anyway thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did don't forget to give it a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed down below. Thank you for following along with my channel this year. I wish you all the best for 2018. I'm sure I will have many new lovely books to share with you guys. I hope you have a magical day and a bookish day, and I'll talk to you all again soon.
Bye, guys.